to this live but online event at the Swindon Festival of Literature 2021. We're both pleased and grateful that human ingenuity, cutting edge science and digital technology make it possible for this show to go on, well, at least to go on online. Thank you very much for joining us wherever you are. We have a global audience today. We do hope that everything is well where you are. Now, please note, this event is being both recorded and live streamed online, but only the host, the author and the interviewers will be seen. If you would like to ask a question, please type it in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If your question is chosen, you have a choice of asking your question in person and being seen on live stream or asking the host to ask it on your behalf. If you want your question to be asked, but you do not want to be seen, please prefix your question with unseen. Phew, hope that's clear. Now, notwithstanding spring flowers and birdsong, are we living in wintry times, at least in terms of our spiritual or religious life? What might we in the West learn from Eastern traditions? Where might we look for fresh light and warmth? In his new book, Looking East in Winter, which is actually not published till mid-June, so you are hearing about it here first at the Swindon Festival of Literature, today's guest author has looked into these questions in some depth. Also interested in these questions, from what you might call a professional point of view, are our two guest co-interviewers. Now, please join me in giving a Swindon Festival of Literature welcome to co-interviewers Catherine Okoronkwo and Simon Stevenet, both from Swindon, and today's guest author, former Archbishop of Canterbury and Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge, Regis Professor of Divinity at both Oxford and Cambridge, and author of many, many books. Rowan Williams, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. Hello everyone, lovely to be here. Hello and thank you. Um, well, I know that two of you are from Swindon, but uh, Rowan, I don't know if you know Swindon or have been to Swindon. Swindon in the spring is quite nice. Do you know it? I can't say I've been much further than the station in Swindon. Like most people, I know Swindon mostly is somewhere to go through or to change trains. Mm -hmm. But I do have a very vivid recollection about 25 years ago of being stuck in the waiting room at Swindon for many, many, many hours because there was a rail delay and managing to write a poem during that period. So I have a certain fondness towards Swindon waiting rooms. <laughs> the inspiration in Swindon. Um, we better get back to the topic. Um, your book, Rowan, Looking East in Winter, which you tell us takes its title from an image used by a fifth century writer mm. that looking east in winter we feel the warmth of the sun on our faces while still sensing an icy chill on our backs. How true, when we launched the festival at dawn this year, we looked east over Swindon to the rising sun and we felt a chill on our backs. Um, Rowan, please tell us more. Well, indeed, that, that's the image which, when I first came across it many years ago in the writings of this fifth century Greek Christian writer struck me as most memorable. And when I had thought of gathering together some reflections on how the Eastern Christian tradition impacts on and offers various openings to the Western world, it was that image that most immediately came to mind. Yes, we are conscious that we're looking in a direction from which light and warmth will come. It hasn't quite yet. And in winter, we have to have a certain patience and confidence about the sun rising, taking the time that it takes to rise. And the chill at the back is really there. So in, as I say, putting together these thoughts about the Eastern Christian tradition, that's where I started from. The sense that a lot of us feel it's quite a wintry season. A wintry season in terms of a Western world which in many ways is confused and adrift, politically uncertain, culturally often 
ruthless and confused, defensive and angry. Um, a world in which we're not quite sure how to cope with a set of substantial global crises facing us, which no one nation is able to tackle on its own. And of course, a cultural world which has drifted quite a long way from some of its religious anchorage and its religious roots, and again, can get angry, defensive, muddled, and uh, generally tangled on that subject. So in writing the book, what I had in mind was try to take a deep breath, step back, look at a rather different kind of Christian world with different patterns of thinking about prayer, about human identity, about worship, even about politics. Look at a, another kind of Christian world where some of our Western oppositions and mutual exclusivities haven't worked out in quite the same way. And let's see what we can learn. Now, of course, I'm approaching this as a Western Christian, as a member of the Anglican Church, not the Orthodox Eastern Church, but also as somebody who, I suppose, from my teenage years has had a very strong, um, very involved interest in the world of Eastern Christianity. I rather fell in love with the Russian Christian world when I was a teenager, reading Russian novels, listening to Russian music. And my academic research originally focused on a major Russian writer who had been expelled from Russia after the Russian Revolution. So it's a long-standing interest and one which I suppose in the last 10 years or so has become more deep, more engaged once again, as perhaps rather more people have become interested in that very different, but very generative, very creative Christian world. So let me just say a word about how the book itself unfolds and what's going on in it. I began with a long chapter on the theological world that lies behind some of the teaching on prayer and the spiritual life that you find in Eastern Christianity. One of the things that's often said about the Eastern Christian world is that there's a closer connection for a lot of Eastern Christians between what we call spirituality and the work of theology. And this very long chapter is really an attempt to set out how that works. In other words, some of what you learn about theology is absolutely grounded in what happens to you if you're trying to lead a life of spiritual discipline. It's as if to understand some of the concepts of theology, you have to be a certain sort of person, not, you know, not a better person, not a nicer person or whatever, but a person with certain habits and orientations. You adjust yourself to the world in certain ways, you open yourself to the world in certain ways and to the world's maker. And you find that some new ideas and new perspectives open up because of that. Now that first chapter discusses the great anthology of writing on the life of prayer, which was put together in the 18th century by a Greek monk. It's called the Philokalia, and it's five volumes in the Greek edition and there's a complete English translation just about to be completed with the fifth volume appearing. Although it was put together in the 18th century, it includes material that goes right back to the fourth and fifth century. And that early material is some of the most fascinating in the whole collection. Because it's there that you find people writing about the effects of the spiritual life in the broadest sense on how we see and understand things. And I've written there and in other chapters about one particular writer who emphasizes the difference between being able to see things as it were from a heavenly or angelic point of view and seeing things from the point of view of our own ego or worse still, seeing things from the point of view of the devil, that is the destructive forces. We're always drifting towards seeing other people and seeing the world simply in terms of how they feed our own 
anxieties, our own desires. The angelic or the heavenly perspective on the world is the one where we actually are free to see things for how they are in themselves and see people in themselves and love them for, for themselves, not just for what they do for us and whether they make us feel good or successful or whatever. So right at the, the root of some of this great tradition of reflection on prayer in the Eastern Christian world is that diagnosis of the different ways in which we can see and understand possessive or non-possessive, self-oriented or somehow oriented to what's really there. And part of what the book is trying to do is to explore how that theme works itself out in a number of ways in thinking about our actual concrete social relations with one another, including even politics, how it works out in our thinking about worship, personal prayer and collective prayer, and also how it fleshes itself out in some people's lives. So towards the end of the book, I move to a rather different kind of discussion, which looks in one chapter at certain ways in which holy lives have been represented in Russian literature from the 19th century onwards. And then there's a chapter on a very particularly dramatic holy life of the 20th century, the life of a highly unconventional Russian intellectual and activist, um, Elizaveta, Elizaveta Pilenko originally, who was exiled from Russia after being heavily involved in radical politics, ended up in Paris, and to everybody's amazement became a nun, spent a great deal of her life in Paris working with refugees, originally Russian refugees and then Jewish refugees, was arrested by the Nazis when they arrived in Paris and was eventually killed in a Ravensbrück concentration camp. She's now regarded as a saint and a martyr by parts of the Orthodox Church. But I really wanted to make a kind of arc in the presentation of the book. There's a lot of heavy lifting theory at the beginning of the book, and the first few chapters, thinking not only about how people have reflected on prayer, but also um, some of the implications this might have for our philosophical thinking about the world. What kind of reality is it that we're in the middle of? But all of this only becomes interesting and only becomes arresting when it's fleshed out. And so I wanted the book to move towards that particular story of a very distinctive, very unconventional figure, not at all, in many people's eyes, um, a typical monastic saint, a woman who'd been twice married and twice divorced, who lived as a single mother bringing up three children, two of whom died in early infancy, someone who was exiled from her own country, was herself a refugee and a migrant, and who eventually gave her life out of her commitment to the Jewish people as the Holocaust unfolded. So an unusual figure on any, any showing. And also herself a poet, a visual artist, and a remarkable thinker. And I'll say just a word more about her in a moment. But in between those two bookends of the book, the theoretical introduction about theology and the life of prayer and some of the philosophical themes coming out of that, there are some chapters which look in a little bit more detail at some specific areas of the life of the church and the life of society. One chapter is called Liturgical Humanism, which will sound a very strange title to many people, but it's in some ways a celebration of the work of one particular writer to whose memory the book is dedicated. He was a Frenchman, Olivier Clément, who became a convert to Russian Orthodoxy and wrote a large number of books about current affairs, about literature and culture, as well as about theology. And he, rather like the figure I turned to in the last chapter, it is Vete Pilenko, otherwise Mother Maria Skoptsova, 
he had a very strong conviction that when Christians gathered to celebrate their worship, the liturgy, especially the worship of the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, they were not simply performing a human duty, not just trying to make contact with a distant God. They were stepping into a new world. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is already real when we gather for worship. And it's the difference, you might say, between worship as something we struggle to do in the hope that somehow we attract God's attention and worship as something rather more like stepping under a shower, really entering an environment that wraps us around. And if what happens when we step into worship in that way is that our, our whole human perspective or human relationships are shifted and enlarged and deepened, then of course what we take out from worship is not just a feeling of satisfaction, well that was a nice service, we go out as, as new people with new capacities to build relationship, to make a more human world, hence liturgical humanism. Our imagination, our will, our longing, our perspectives on things are shifted by the experience of worship and by the receiving of the sacramental gifts that are offered in worship, especially in Holy Communion. So writers like Olivier Clément and Mother Maria will talk sometimes about the liturgy after the liturgy. When we've gathered for worship, we go on doing the same thing when we engage with one another in the attempt to make a more human, a more just and a more joyful world. We go out into our engagement in human relationships, the life of society, as people who carry with them a whole set of connections with the rest of humanity that are deepened and strengthened through worship. So let me go back just for a moment to my concluding figure, Mother Maria, this great saintly figure in Paris. She wrote a couple of essays, not very well known, unfortunately, but hugely important, in which she said that for Christians to be engaged in the life of the society around them wasn't a kind of optional extra, which made them slightly better individuals. It wasn't even a matter of Christian, individual Christians thinking, well, I have a calling to sacrificial love and service, and that's how I become a better person. No, Mother Maria says something rather deeper is going on. The Christian is already connected with the needy, the poor, the excluded, already bound in with them. Like it or not, if you're a Christian, united with Jesus Christ, you are actually, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, you're actually there, tied in with the life of the poor and the needy. And for her in Paris in the late 1930s and early 1940s, that meant that you were bound in with the suffering and the crisis faced by Jewish people under the Nazis. When the um, Nazi administrators of occupied Paris declared that Jewish people in France should wear a yellow star on their clothing to mark them out as Jews, and of course to make them easier to arrest and round up, Mother Maria declared very publicly that all Christians should now also wear a yellow star because they belonged with those people who were outcast and at risk. So that's a very strong statement of the effect of Christian identity. And it's something which is rooted in a long tradition, especially in Russian religious thinking. And there are a couple of chapters in the book where I look back to how, for example, in 19th century Russia, there was quite a lot of reflection on the nature of Christian community. There's a Russian word, or actually originally an old Slavonic word used in the old Slavonic church service, Sobornost, which is usually translated as 
togetherness or the spirit of community or something like that. It's the word used in the creed to translate the familiar word Catholic. One holy Catholic church in the creed. In the old Slavonic, it's one holy suborne, one holy conciliar, communal, transpersonal reality. So the word Catholic doesn't just mean universal or continuous or traditional. Catholic means bound to one another. And in the middle of the 19th century, there's a whole school of writers emerging who are picking up this word and using it in various ways. And it's this vision that gets into the novels of Dostoevsky, the greatest, or one of the two greatest Russian novelists of the 19th century. Dostoevsky, who believed that the essence of our human dignity and our Christian calling was to accept that we were responsible for our fellow human beings. As with Mother Maria, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, we are already engaged, we're already involved with one another. And that tradition in the Russian world, which fleshes itself out so dramatically in the life of somebody like Mother Maria, though there are many other lives that one might turn to, that tradition which appears in Russian fiction, poetry, novels, dramas, that's also something which affects some of the ways in which Russian Christian writers have talked about the role of tradition in the common life of the church. Tradition is not just inheriting ways of doing things. Tradition is a dynamic, unfolding, ongoing sharing of life. Tradition means a handing over, a passing over. And what is passed over, what is handed down in the life of the Christian community? is precisely that, it's life. It's a set of perspectives, imaginative orientations, new capacities for feeling and seeing, all of them conveyed through the action of a church which worships sacramentally, all conveyed through the continuity of a community and an institution in history. But those things, the forms of worship, the forms of ministry, the continuity in history, all of those things are there so that life can be transmitted. And these new perspectives on reality, the angelic, the heavenly vision, can be made real. So that affirms both the significance of the outward forms of the church, but also the way in which those outward forms always serve a continuity of seeing and acting. So to sum up very briefly, I think what this book is trying to do is to, first of all, to suggest how spiritual perspectives and habits, the cultivation of receptive, quiet, contemplative prayer, how those things open up new places in us, and new abilities to see and therefore to relate to one another. It's a book which tries to see how a picture of the natural world, as well as the reality of other people, how that can grow from that sort of discipline and the place within that of organized formal worship. Definitely not as an end in itself, but as a, an immersion, a kind of bathing in a reality greater than we are, that extends our vision and our capacity day by day. And on the basis of that, to understand that there's something about this Christian vision which opens up to us the levels at which we, each one of us as a human being, is connected to other human beings, how in the unique community that is the church, those connections with the rest of humanity become deeper and more demanding. So you might say to belong to the church is not to belong to a, a kind of protected human minority, defending itself against a hostile world. To belong in the church is to belong with the human family at a deeper level than we've ever imagined, with all the risks and all the demands that carries with it. And yet, that vision is not a kind of 
what should I say, not a kind of moral demand, it's something given to us, an enrichment of our humanity and part of the joy that we share. And in this somewhat wintry world of political confusion, religious alienation, cynicism about community, authority and tradition, in our world of defensiveness and polarization, I think all of this is a direction worth looking in, somewhere where you can feel the sun on your face a bit. Rowan, thank you very much. Um, plenty food for thought there. Um, I've read the book and while Simon and Catherine uh, think of their first questions, um, and maybe Catherine, if you go first, um, and since this is a literature festival, um, I, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you about self-awareness that you write about, um, uh, when you say loving what is not merely human means you can love all, um, it's not who we, it, it's who we are that counts, not what we do that counts, there are so many things that come up in this book, but you also mentioned yourself just now that there's a lot of heavy lifting theory, as you put it. Um, and, uh, and I noticed that uh, as I was reading. And I also noticed something, and since this is a festival of literature, I want to ask you about your writing style and, and whether that has some bearing on discussing religion in this way. Um, in your writing style, you pepper your pages with single inverted commas on individual words Mm. not to indicate paraphrase, but I, I, I imagine to indicate this word doesn't quite do literally mm. what the dictionary definition suggests it does. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's tricky to talk about what you are talking about. Am, am, I, am I onto something there, Rowan? You're onto something really important there, um, which is more than just an irritating tick on my part when I write. I, I do have to watch it sometimes. Um, but yes, I, I do want occasionally to say to people, yes, this word sounds familiar, but don't, don't rush to assume you know exactly what it means. Let it, let it hang there. It's a helpful thing to hold on to. It's not going to give you everything. And that, that again is really part of what's been a constant theme in the thinking and the writing of Eastern Christians over the years, over the centuries. The, the sense that language is necessary, unavoidable, that it always opens out onto perspectives that are rather more than you might anticipate. Don't be surprised if the words crumble under you from time to time. Um, and sometimes putting together a theological argument may feel like jumping across a river from ice flow to ice flow in a rather <laughs> insecure way but you know use the words learn to use them as what the buddhists might call skillful means you know a, a real set of handholds don't imagine that language is going to give you the, the essence of everything in a way that you can possess own and manage completely um, thank you very much uh, i think Rainer maria rilke said everything is not so utterable in words as many people would have you believe. Sometimes it's best to be quiet. <laughs> I, I, that, that very word quiet, of course, in, in Greek is, is a key word right throughout the, the Eastern spiritual tradition. What you have to learn is quiet, which doesn't just mean shutting up. It means learning the rhythms by which you move in and out of receptive attention and letting that receptivity dictate not dictates the wrong word but shape and mold more and more of, of your response to things so that what's drawn out of you is fuller and more deeply rooted lovely thank you um catherine thank you rowan for all that you've offered in your presentation um i was struck particularly by the idea of being able to see things from the angelic and heavenly and I'm especially struck by Mother Maria, 
Um, it seems that she embodies a Christ justice. Mm. So my first question is going to be around justice, if you're okay with that. Um, in light of all that has happened in the past year, there seems to be a real energy in the Church of England, at least in some quarters, to begin that much needed work to respond to the action, in action rather, to the sin of all manner of injustices. But with a focus on racial injustice, because you speak about refugees and um, migrants, um, et cetera, I just wonder from your reflections on the Eastern Christian world, where you think we as a church, that is the Church of England, might turn to for um, opportunities or possibilities for redemptive and transfiguring work. Mm. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, yes, you're quite right. This, this is a, a real focus of how the, the book eventually unfolded and um, putting it all together and finalising it in the last 12 months as some of these issues became more and more prominent in public, I felt you know, this is, for all the, the heavy lifting theory, this is not actually of academic interest only. Mm -hmm. And talking about Mother Maria, I'm more and more persuaded that she's a voice we need to hear. But in, in response to your particular question, I think there are two things I'd want to say about the nature of the seeing and the acting that that we're drawn into. If Mother Maria is right and the, the background she comes from is right, then the one thing we're never really doing is, so to speak, acting, as the French say, en bas. we're not acting from the top down. We're not, we're not the ones who've got things that we need generously to, to give to others. We're all receivers as well as givers. And one of the great images Mother Maria comes up with is that Christians are supposed to be parenting other people into life. Every Christian is in a mutual relationship of parenting, mothering. We're bringing people to life. And we're bringing them to life so that we can receive life from them, not just us giving life to them. And so often we think of our love and our service as what we generously give to the less fortunate. But the world we're trying to build, surely, is a world in which everyone shares, everyone gives. And we don't have this active love and passive recipient, the, the generous donor and the poor destitute receiver. We want a world where dignity is recognized all around so that gifts are shared. Now, when we think about how, how we work for a more inclusive church in the way that you're talking about, especially on the racial front, mm -hmm. that's absolutely front and center, isn't it? That we're saying here are voices that have been silenced, here are gifts that have never been allowed to be given. Mm -hmm. How do we not um, benevolently give something to these poor needy people who've been shut out, but how do we actually make space for them to act and give and speak as they're supposed to. Because here's another thing which the book talks about a bit um, in the context of some of the early Christian speculation. Every created being, not just human beings, carries a word from God. Every reality we encounter is, so to speak, balanced on a word from God, it's carrying, it's, it's almost surfing, you might say, on a communication from God. And when we encounter another person, when we encounter the world around, we're encountering that word that is sailing towards us on, on the basis of God's communication, something of love and intelligence and vision and energy pouring out towards us. So how do we, as I say, how do we make space for that to be received, not just for us to be giving, but for us to be sharing and that exchange, that sort of extraordinary circulation of life in the body. That's, that's what we should be pushing for. And it's hard work because we quite like to be in control. We quite like to be the generous givers. Mother Maria is very, very good on this. She says, you know, it's, it's terrific that people want to be nice to other people, but hey, being nice to other people is not actually what it's finally about. 
it's being part of a world which together is reflecting the abundance of God and together building something new in the world. Thank you so much, Rowan. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Rowan. Um, Simon. Rowan, thank you for all your inspiration. Take an overview of all your writing and ministry. What is the heart of your hope for the future? And how do we best communicate that hope today in our generation in the West and in the East? Mm. Um, very big question and a very focused <laughs> question at the same time. Um, well, I suppose the heart of what I've always tried to work for and care about and witness to in ministry and scholarship and whatever has been that sense that we need to find the skills that open us up to the transforming energy that is God. If we simply think of solving problems, getting on top of situations, or as I was saying just now, um, being benevolent and helpful to other people, if we think of that, yep, yeah, okay, fine. But the basic thing is how do I make room for something more than myself to come in to change me and to change the environment I'm in? And that does mean I have to learn the disciplines of when not to speak, when not to flail around anxiously and try and look for answers. I, I need those spaces of stepping back, breathing deeply and allowing the reality of God to be there. So one of the chapters in the book is about what the contemplative mindset might have to say to politics. Because a lot of people would say, surely this is a completely different world. You know, politics is all about planning and action and you know, making, making a difference and contemplation and prayer are just about stepping back and sitting still. Well, at the very basic level, without a degree of stepping back and sitting still, the actions we're engaged in and the planning we undertake is more and more liable to be dictated not by the reality in front of us, but by our own inner anxiety, our own passion to be on top of things, our own passion to be seen to be active. You know, we can be running around like hamsters on a wheel, pretending because we're very busy that we're actually making a difference. But stepping back and sitting still is one way of saying, now let's just wait and see what, what there is there. Before I try to run in with my answers, let's see what the questions are. Let's hear and see before all that starts. So I think that's, that's something that's been with me as a, a kind of challenge, kind of anxiety about our anxiety about our anxieties from when I first started thinking about Christian faith and my worry about the world we're in and the culture we're in is that we are so feverish, so taken up with short-term fixes that we end up with the kind of, and I'm going to be very blunt now, the kind of cosmetic gestural politics that surrounds us without really ever tackling the long-term issues that we can only tackle together and patiently and selflessly. So we've we've got quite a hill to climb there, I think. Thanks, Rowan. Um, your book is in, in four sections, um, prologue, analogue, dialogue, and epilogue. Mm. Uh, and then it has subsections within that. Mm. Uh, and, and it's very nice to follow to follow those those different ways of looking at things. Um, and in the analogue section, you you have a, a passage which says, we have learned rightly to be wary of appeals to rationality, the characteristic modern age, uh, modern usage of the term is instrumental and focused on the reasoning skills in debate of individuals. It normally stands at a fastidious distance from any kind of metaphysical, let alone spiritual concern. And if someone said to me, what's that book about? What's that book about? And they want it in 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 a soundbite. I would feel slightly forced to say it is sort of Western rational logical thinking 
uh, versus or in relation to Eastern um, mystical spiritual thinking. And they would then respond to me, I'm imagining all this, Rowan. they would then say to me, oh, you're such a hippie, Matt, or something like that. Mm -hmm. In other words, how do we steer towards what you are steering towards in this book without doing too much heavy theory lifting <laughs> with all due respects and equally not dumbing down to some level where people just push push it away how do we how do you do that mm. i've often found myself saying in the last couple of years that one of the biggest problems we have in our educational system is that we tend to distinguish between hard thinking and soft thinking hard knowing and soft knowing we think that a particular kind of scientific language is the only thing that really counts as knowing reality and the fact is that in in our human lives we make use of different kinds of reasoning different kinds of rationality we reason in certain ways about without noticing it often about our bodily exercises we, we reason when we learn to ride a bicycle that is our bodies adjust they find ways of being ways of coping and balancing we reason in our emotional lives not in a kind of arm's length um, summing up arguments way but we adjust we listen we absorb we respond and what I want above all is to think of that notion of reasoning and rationality as much broader than we often assume. I've been very much helped here by all sorts of contemporary writers, um, some scientists, some philosophers, some neuroscientists, who in different ways have challenged this very narrowly focused problem solving mindset. Ian McGilchrist's terrific book, The Master and His Emissary, a few years ago. Very, very long book. And, you know, if you think this one has heavy lifting theory, you should read that. But, you know, there is someone who trained in medicine, psychoanalysis, and English literature, who knows a great deal about neuroscience, saying there are different ways in which the brain works, different ways in which reasoning works. And the tragedy of our modern environment is that there's one particular mode of operation, a very narrow one, which seems to have taken over all the rest. So it's not exactly a, a soundbite response, but if, if I did have to give a soundbite summary, I'd say, let's think again about what thinking is like and see if we've got that straight. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, we've got time for uh, another another question, each a shortish, shortish question, shortish answer, if that's possible. Um, Catherine or Simon? Um, as you were speaking, Rowan, um, a question I kept asking myself is how have we got to where we are? Um, and you offer some interesting reflections on new ways of thinking about our spirit selves in terms of our experiences and our expressions. And I'd like to ask, um, perhaps you can comment, why do you think that we, that is humanity, has moved so far from that God ideal of whole self and whole self in community, if that makes sense, mm. uh, because we just seem to be so fragmented in our internal and external worlds. Um, and I think an understanding of why we've got to where we've got to might be helpful. Mm. Thank you. Difficult to put your finger on, on one simple thing, but I guess there are a couple of things that could be said. First of all, we found out probably as recently as 500, 600 years ago, that we were really, really good at some kinds of problem solving. And when you're good at something, you, you stick in your comfort zone. We got better and better and better at problem solving. And we thought of more and more interesting technical and practical problems to solve. And we built up the hugely impressive edifice of the modern scientific worldview. Um, unfortunately, at the same time, we were losing our focus 
on some aspects of the religious worldview. We, because of, often because of the internal controversies and struggles within the church, we got very fixated on getting it right, capital G, capital I, capital R, and we're busy killing each other in the 16th century and afterwards because of that. And so we somehow lost the idea that what was, what was really important about the religious worldview was its capacity to transform our relationships. And we lost the idea of a God who was not just another big inhabitant of the world, but was the, the unimaginably deep, complex and rich life, which sustains and upholds the whole thing, which flows in everything. We lost the, the, the extraordinary, mysterious focus of belief in God, the Holy Trinity in the Christian world, that sense that the, the most basic reality there is, is already a set of relationships. So put together our brilliant problem solving and our sense that God was a it really just a distant source of power and authority. And you end up with a world of enormously sophisticated scientific thinking and problem solving, and a sense that relig the religious worldview is thin, unimaginative, and actually rather oppressive. And lo and behold, put those together, and what do you have? You have something rather like the culture we live in at the moment, with a deep nostalgia for the spiritual sometimes, a deep unease about some ways of dogmatic scientific thinking, but not quite knowing what to do with all that. So the book, I suppose, to some extent comes out of my own wrestling with, with that and finding a way through it and beyond it. Thank you, thank you. Simon. Thank you, Rowan, I'm passionate for <clears throat> ecumenical working and reconciliation. And I suppose my question would be, you know, our highest common factors. So how might those in the East be strengthened by looking West in their winter? Mm. What have we got to offer them? Good question. And I think it's exactly in, in tune with what I'm saying about the, the reciprocal mutual side of, of the relations we're talking about. We in the West have, have been through the huge trauma of the last half millennium, the Reformation, the, the Enlightenment, the whole 20th century eruption of new intellectual and political currents that have torn up a great deal of the traditional world. And that's damaged us, but it's also given us some strength in coping with, let's say, an ability for self-criticism. We've recognized that there are some challenges which may, may sound very serious, very destructive coming from outside, and yet we have somehow to make them our own and see how those questions work within us. The, the strength, the solidity of the Eastern Christian tradition is very often in its unbrokenness. It hasn't been through those traumas. At the same time, that can mean that in such a world, the church does everything that it's not supposed to in, in Eastern Christian theological terms. It becomes another defensive institutional presence. So that's why I'm fascinated by figures like Olivier Clément and Mother Maria, who are deeply rooted in the Eastern Christian world and yet very much engaging with that self-critical, um, transformative, slightly risky presence of the modern and postmodern world. So maybe there are there are conversations to be had there. And I, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that there are many people in the Eastern Christian world, in Russia and Greece and the Middle East today, who do want to entertain those questions and and show that the depth and resourcefulness of their own tradition can manage those questions and those challenges. Just very briefly, in terms of the inquiring mind. Um, Mary Oliver, the poet, her phrase is, uh, what is a prayer? Mm. I just, you know, for those inquiring Swindonians who ask Catherine and I and Matt, you know, what is a prayer? Any wisdom from the East to help us answer that? Mary Oliver's question, please. 
perhaps the, the simplest way of starting there is that a prayer is anything that you allow to arise within you moving out towards the mystery of God. Any moment of thought, feeling or whatever that arises and is directed beyond your own self-protection, your own self-comforting. That's at least the very beginning of prayer. And in the full theological framework, you know, that's already God acting within you, moving in you to, towards his own centre. Thanks very much, Rowan. Um, we, this is a classic example of we really just getting going now. Um, what did Wordsworth say? Long we had not talked, then we built up a pile of better thoughts, and we just want to keep going. And we have questions from, from our, our worldwide audience. Um, Pat is asking about how, how frustrated she feels about her compassion for, for the poor and the suffering in these times of of uh, coronavirus. Um, uh, another person, Paul, mentions how we should uh, uh, think of not how does Christ see me, um, not so much how do we see Christ, but how does Christ see me. But but we haven't got time for that. So sorry, guys out there. Um, if only because I want to ask the last question, we have to we have to close down, and that is that you mentioned in your book, it's who we are that counts for more, almost for more than what we do. Mm -hmm. And uh, at two o'clock at the Swindon Festival of Literature, the next event is uh, about a book called Another Life is Possible by people who are living out their beliefs. And it links very much to what Catherine said about how fractured the world is. And, uh, and I noticed that you wrote the introduction to that book uh, the, for the Bruderhof. And I should declare an interest here my parents joined and I was conceived and born in with that group and and it has left a very in my opinion the nice side of me comes from them the nasty side is the bit I added um but but serious the serious question to you is how can we live out what we believe difficult one to answer in just a couple of minutes but um <laughs> Any answer to that, I think, also does carry with it answers to the the points you you quoted from Pat and from Paul. Um, we're called to live a life in which we always are aware that whoever we encounter is someone who is seen by Christ, seen by God, as immeasurably valuable. And so we always ask, her, how do I act towards this person in a way that somehow reflects that immeasurable value, that dignity? And it's not just about human beings, it's about the sentient world and the environment too. So compassion, Pat's point, becomes not, again, not just a matter of feeling, but sort of, as I think of it, remembering Sybil Faulty in Faulty Towers, you know, the oh, I know reaction. <laughs> it's, it's not just that. It's a real recognition that what is good for my neighbour, what is life-giving for my neighbour, is something I have to care about because my own life is bound up with theirs. And we need a social life, a political life, a cultural life in which those two th recognitions are central. The dignity, the immeasurable dignity, of any person I encounter, whether I like them or not, agree with them or not, approve of them or not, but the immeasurable dignity at the heart of it. And then that sense that I can't be safe, well, secure, whatever, without their wellness and their security. Our destinies, our fates are really bound together and I'm connected at a level deeper than I can really get hold of. It's not quite the kind of society we live in at the moment, but it's worth working for. And communities like the Bruderhof, communities like the Sojourners community in Washington, D.C., um, many other bodies across the world, the Lush communities, which work on that basis, common interest, common destiny, common welfare, and the sense of immeasurable dignity. Those are the ones that tell us that, indeed, to quote the title of the book, something else is possible. I'm Rowan, thank you very much. And there's so much in this book. There's so many ideas. Um, 
next time we'll have you we'll get you away from the station and writing poetry there and we'll get you <laughs> into the heart of Swindon where the people who are asking questions and want to ask questions can have a longer chat with you um, details of Rowan's book will appear on the recording of this event um, we'll put up the details of where you can get the book which isn't out yet it's out in June we'll put the details up there so you can see it um, to our audience out there all of you thank you very much for joining us um, if you know friends who you want to see it, it will be up as a recording later in the day to our co-interviewers Catherine Okoronkwo and Simon Stevenet the Swindon Festival of Literature says thank you very much but most of all the Swindon Festival of Literature says thank you Rowan Williams thank you Thank you to the Swindon Festival of Literature. It's been a great joy to be part of this conversation. I'm very grateful to you, Matt, and to Catherine, and to Simon for such a stimulating set of questions. And I'm sorry we didn't have more time to hear from the audience, but thanks to them for joining online.